Y'all can have a seat. Good morning. My name is Buck Anderson. I'm the pastor of leadership development over at the Anderson campus. Gets a substitute for the preacher boys every once in a while. It's my privilege to be with you. We are finishing our series in uh, the study of uh, theology this summer, and appropriately, our last one is today on the subject of the end times. So we've ordered some pizzas. We'll be get here to around two or three this afternoon. Take a look at uh, what God has in store for us. The fancy word, uh, if you go to Bible college or seminary, you'll take a course called eschatology. It's not that hard to figure out. It's a Greek word, eschatos. It simply means last things. But for our purposes, we're going to take a look at unfulfilled biblical prophecy. The Bible in toto is 28% prophetic. Um, a little more than one of every four verses, it doesn't literally work out that because there's huge sections, but 28% of the Bible was prophetic. Now, most of those prophecies have been fulfilled already around the person of Jesus Christ, but there's a lot left to come. If you'll recall Jesus' last words in, in, in Acts chapter 1 where he says, you see me go up into heaven, I'm coming back the same way. And so the beauty of unfulfilled prophecy still revolves around the person of Jesus Christ and his return and the things that he has in store for us in the future. Now, most of the time we think of prophecy and we kind of get the willies. We see the four horsemen and all this stuff in the book of Revelation, and, and we can maybe shy away from that or say, you know, I can't understand that. That's, that's too hard. It's a bunch of visions and it's some Old Testament stuff, and I don't know if I can understand that. My favorite literature to interpret is apocalyptic or, or prophetic literature because although it's symbols and, and all sorts of visions, there is some consistency, especially among Daniel, especially among Jesus in Matthew 24, especially among the book of Revelation. And we can uh, take a look at the idea of prophecy maybe through a different lens. I hope to uh, let us see that prophecy really is something that can draw our attention to God. It's a different way, if you will, to reconnect to God. It lets us see the wonderful, amazing, powerful accuracy of the Word of God, as well as God's power and His wisdom, His plan and purpose, not only for the past that we've seen fulfilled, but what awaits in the future. It will help protect from counterfeit, for God will tell us the truth. There's also a personal ethic, an everyday response to prophecy, comfort and holiness in light of the fact of the sure and certain return of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom biblical prophecy ultimately reveals. The book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, it's not Revelations, by the way, Revelation, because it is the singular revelation of Jesus Christ in all his fullness, and we'll end our time there, obviously, today. I love what Paul writes to the, uh, in, in Titus as he sort of captures, in a couple of verses, the essence of prophecy. For the grace of God has appeared, notice there's a past tense, a present tense, and a future element of these verses. For God, uh, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Based on what God has done in the past, I can live right now, but he doesn't leave us there. He also gives us another motivation to live correctly looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So prophecy has everyday Tuesday afternoon application. It's also a lot of, of information. God is amazing. He's overwhelming at times. We're going to take a look at some stuff today, but I never want to move away from this, that we are to live in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is certainly returning and all the components of that return. Now, I went to Dallas Seminary in the mid-80s, and I can't help it, but I've got a lot of prophecy charts. I'm only going to show two of them today. I had to leave behind 20 or 30, okay? We use prophecy charts for wallpaper where I come from. The idea of a prophecy chart gives us some sense of what might be going on. We're going to take a look, obviously, at the age of the church. I'm going to argue that the rapture will end the age of the church. Then the tribulation will follow. A millennial kingdom will follow after that. And what the Bible calls new heaven and new earth will then be revealed. So those are the four likely suspects that we're going to round up today and take a look at. The rapture, the tribulation period, the millennial kingdom and new heaven and new earth. And through those four aspects, I want you to note what God is doing. That which was made right, Genesis 1 and 2, 
was, has been ruined by sin and our participation in that starting in Genesis 3. And throughout that time, ever since Genesis 3 and the fall, all the way until the culminating event in Revelation 22, God is taking that which has been made right, now ruined by sin, and is restoring it. And biblical prophecy really accentuates, it really accelerates the restoration process. So I want us to, to think through that lens as well. The first thing we're going to look at is the rapture. If you've got your Bibles, you can go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to have lots of slides today, so I'll, all the stuff I'm going to say will be on the screen if you prefer that. But if you want to mark your Bible up or take a look on your, on your phones, that's great. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It, it, Paul is responding to this group of people that he spent a lot of time with, by the way, and he wants them to, to know what's going to happen to those Christians that have died or fallen asleep. He will use that euphemism. What happens to believers who have passed away? And Paul is going to respond to that, and we'll pick it up in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's going to say, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So what we're learning about the rapture immediately is that it's a resurrection of some kind, and those that have already passed away will be translated or resurrected first then the mystery follows. Then we who are alive and remain, that is, alive Christians on the planet, after Christians who have passed have been resurrected, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And that's the word in which this whole idea of rapture comes from. Together with them, notice where? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And notice how he ends with a word of comfort. Therefore, Comfort one another with these words. Don't worry about your deceased uh, friends and who are believers. They're fine. They're going to be resurrected first. We're going to then be resurrected. At the same time, a generation on the planet will not experience death. Go immediately before the Lord, meeting them all in the clouds in the air. So let's take a look at this word just to make sure we see it. Because it's a word, the word rapture doesn't show up at all in an English Bible. But the concept does. And the Greek word translated caught up here might be some help to us. It's the Greek word harpazo. It occurs about 20 times in the Greek New Testament. It's going uh, it, to, this will be the word that Jerome will translate in the Latin Vulgate from the rapio verb family in Latin. And by the time you get to medieval Latin, harpazo is translated raptura in the Latin Bible. The Latin Bible is a very popular Bible from the Reformation on, certainly. And so that idea of raptur or rapture came directly over into the English language. The word concept is noteworthy. It, it denotes that of a, of a sudden, fierce, strong seizing or snatching. Uh, in, in classical Greek, purse snatchers were referred to by this name. That would, those that would come and grab quickly and with power. And in the, as Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, it happens quickly. Notice there are some other usages of the same word, by the way, in the New Testament. Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians, says, I know a man, he's talking about himself, in Christ who 14 years ago such a man was caught up into the third heaven. And such a man was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We also see the same idea when Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. All of a sudden, Philip was snatched away, as Acts 8 tells us. They came up out of the water and the Spirit snatched Philip away. And no eunuch, and the eunuch rather, no longer saw him. And he went on his way rejoicing. Great power in this word, this sudden idea. Elsewhere, the Bible refers to the rapture, not by using that word harpazo, but the concept remains intact. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us how quickly it will happen. I tell you a mystery, that which has not been re revealed before. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So there's great passion and power behind this word. I think Jesus alluded to it in John 14, one of the most famous chapters in the Gospel of John. He writes, in my father's house, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, 
and I go there and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again for you. The certainty of his return restated here. I will come again and receive you to myself. I think that's the rapture imagery. For where I am there, you will also be. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul allowing the Thessalonians to learn some more, I think, about this wonderful future event. He says, we are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus. Now, now notice, not a comforting per se uh, ethic of the concept of rapture, but now the certainty of rescue, of removal from wrath, I think removal of, from the tribulation. He's going to say, this Jesus will rescue us from the wrath to come. Well, what wrath to come? I think John is going to comment on that same wrath in Revelation chapter 3. Notice the precision with how he writes. He's going to say, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell upon the earth. That phrase, those that dwell upon the earth, I think is the key. That same phrase occurs ten times elsewhere in the book of Revelation. Throughout the book of Revelation, the primary bulk of the book is, is focused on the subject of the tribulation period. And those who dwell on the earth, every other time in the book of Revelation are those undergoing the tribulation period. And he's saying, I'm here to keep you out of that hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world. We're going to see this idea unfolds as the book of Revelation unfolds. We see in the next chapter, in chapter 4, this sort of hint, but there's a couple of things embedded here that I think is worth our time. Notice in chapter 4, he says, John writes, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I'd heard was that of a trumpet speaking to me. Notice his words, come up here. Revelation chapter 4 is two chapters before the tribulation period begins. And John is hearing these words come up here. The key is to whom were those words spoken. And I will show you what must take place. As you see Revelation 4 unfold, you see who's in heaven as this group called the 24 elders. They appear five or six times in the book of Revelation throughout the tribulation period and before it. And they're seen as uh, individuals who have crowns and thrones and white garments representing righteousness. They worship. They issue forth the prayers of the saints. I think they represent the church in heaven prior to the tribulation period. In keeping with what we've seen before, I think the person, or the, the, uh, the presence rather of these elders, especially focusing on the concept of crowns, might help us unlock another step in unfulfilled prophecy, which I think is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Believers now enjoy our time with the Lord. It's a certain and sure destiny. And when we die or when we're raptured, our faith is going to be evaluated, not for a heaven or hell destiny, that type of judgment, but rather the quality of our faith. And I think the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema, is held in heaven for the raptured church during the same time that the seven-year tribulation period unfolds on the earth. This judgment seat of Christ is the place and occasion for the divine evaluation of faithfulness of each Christian's life, resulting in the giving or withholding of rewards or crowns like we saw in Revelation chapter 4. It's supported in 2 Corinthians 5, also 1 Thessalonians as well as 1 Corinthians 3. The wonder of of prophecy can help us think through all sorts of things. Of course, everybody wants to know, when is the rapture? I do not have the answer to that question. I've got some ideas. I think it's the next great event in biblical prophecy. Some will hold it's before the tribulation. Those guys and gals are known as pre-tribbers. Some will hold that the tribulation is not that bad at the first, and at the midpoint it gets particularly bad, and the church is part of the first half of the tribulation, and then they move out. And then others will hold that the rapture is just another word for the second coming of Christ, or we are raptured, meet the Lord in the air, and then come back with the Lord at the end of the tribulation. I think there are several reasons to make a probable case that the rapture is, in fact, before the tribulation, and I want to show you some of the, my reasoning for that and how we can get there. 
I think God's pattern, seen especially in the book of Genesis and elsewhere, is to remove the righteous before wrath. He did that with Noah and his family. All of them were considered righteous. The rest were considered wicked. Lot, although he behaves poorly in Genesis, Second Peter says he is considered righteous and he's removed before Sodom was destroyed. And the Passover provides a beautiful image of the righteous being passed over from judge, over judgment because of their proper relation to the Lord. The idea of the righteous being removed also uh, lends forth the idea that we see biblically there are two main characters, sort of two torchbearers, two representatives of God on earth. In the Old Testament, it's Israel. The Mosaic Law, they're birthed, if you will, in Exodus 19. The church is not a part of that. The church is a separate entity, not birthed until Acts chapter 2, a second actor on the stage, if you will. And both, by the way, both Israel and the church are individually memorialized in Revelation chapter 21. The gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. The stones are named after the 12 apostles of the Lamb. They're different actors who play a different role. I think they're distinct entities. And that helps us understand that the rapture primarily focuses on the church, which is not a part of Israel, and that the second coming and the tribulation primarily focuses on the nation of Israel. And I think we can see that that seven-year period, that oasis, is distinctly Israel, and we're going to notice that in just a moment. So what's the takeaway from our time of study of the rapture, this idea that this immediately, immediate catching up into heaven of all believers who uh, are on the planet at that time, it reminds us that the Lord is returning. I think this is the first aspect of his return. It's in the air. It's in the clouds. It's not to the earth. It is a resurrection, by and large, of all Christians from the time of Pentecost until the time of rapture. Some will be immediately resurrected as we're still alive and bypass death. And that's the, the wonder of that idea of, of the rapture for the generation that can experience it, those that are caught up without experiencing physical death. There's an ethic of reunion. We're going to meet former believers that we may have known and all the other saints from Pentecost till the day, as well as meet the Lord in the air. And the beauty of that time together, I take that seven-year time in heaven while the tribulation period on earth unfolds. And notice how Paul used it, though, words of comfort, words of reassurance. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the rapture, uh, although this mysterious kind of thing, has some actual application and understanding for our everyday life. So you see the rapture really in the church age, and if you follow that pattern of that which is, was right has now been ruined, is now being redeemed, I think you'll see how prophecy, how end times understanding can help us now move into the next phase. I want you to imagine if the rapture is true, if it's a real thing, and that in a single moment, millions and millions of people vanish. They're all Christians. They've been salt and light in this very difficult world. There is economic, political you name it, food, uh, any kind of uh, political problem that you can imagine is going to emerge from what at that time will be the most cataclysmic event in the history of the world. Millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people missing. And I think out of that rubble, a, san a satanically enhanced antichrist will emerge and he'll have some answers and people will listen, and people will follow, and he will deceive them and fake them out, including the nation of Israel, and add to the horror and chaos of this next period of time that we understand to be the tribulation period. The tribulation period, I think, appropriately follows the rapture because Christians are missing. We're not organized anymore. There's no big churches. There's no breakaway. There's Bible studies in which you better be careful about having them as people come to Christ and often under the penalty of martyrdom and death. The time of the tribulation focuses on Israel. And it is run by Antichrist. Christians come to, people come to faith, but under great duress. It is a time unparalleled, as Jesus would say. I think the key 
section of scripture that helps delineate, helps set outside this seven-year period that awaits us or awaits the world is found in Daniel chapter 9. If you want to go there, verses 24 through 27, I've got some of it up on the screen. One of the things we have to do in, in the Old Testament, especially Daniel, we have to kind of change our culture a little to fit theirs. They talk a little different than we do. They use terms different. It starts off with an unusual way of counting time. He's going to say to Israel and, and, and uh, the city of Jerusalem that you've got 70 weeks left, 70 periods of seven. There's a little math that we had to do this morning. Seven times seven, 490 years, he's saying, in this amazing prophecy, the most amazing prophecy, I think, in the entire Word of God. He says, 77s or 490 years have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for inequity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the whole, most holy place. And you are to know, so he says, be aware. I want you to know that from the time of the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's found in Nehemiah chapter 2, until Messiah will be this added up section of seven weeks plus 62 weeks, 69 weeks of the 70 will take you from Nehemiah to Jesus. What's left? One seven-year period that's yet unfulfilled. And I think that's the essence of the tribulation period, the remaining week of Daniel's prophecy that in which the Bible focuses its lens not on the church anymore, but now back to Israel. And this character that will emerge in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation known as the Antichrist. Messiah will be cut off. He prophesies his crucifixion and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That could be the Romans with Titus, but I think it might be something else because the language gets more flowery. It gets broader than just something historical that's already happened. Notice, its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined, and here's the key. And he, Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, that last week of Daniel, that last seven-year period. The many, in this case, is Israel, those to whom Daniel is writing. And he will put a sacri stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Jesus will refer to this in a moment. I promised you two charts. Here's the second one. The main thing I want you to focus on is the sort of the blue, purple, and the green. Daniel says, I got 70 weeks for you, Israel. 69 of those have been used up from the time that Nehemiah was told to go back and build the wall so the temple could be reinstituted until the time of Jesus. That was a 69-week period, 483 years, if you will, if, 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 by their language. And if you, cut, if you convert to solar years, you'll see it's 476. But for our purposes, there's one week left. One seven-year period, interestingly, divided in the book of Daniel by halves in the middle of the week, he will set uh, this firm covenant aside. And we see the book of Revelation correspond to that. It'll use the term 1,260 days. Do the math. With a 360-day year, that's three and a half years, or 42 months. That's three and a half years. The Lord will end that period of time. But for our purpose, there's one seven-year period, and Jesus comments on it most powerfully. There's not been such a time from the beginning of the world unto now, nor ever shall. The worst of wars, the worst of atrocities that have happened on the planet are going to be dwarfed by what you see unfold in the tribulation period. There's unparalleled world terror and calamity, primarily enhanced by the ever-powerful role of Antichrist throughout the seven-year period. God's wrath ultimately been set aside for years. Ultimately, it's time for judgment. You really can't be just unless you bring judgment eventually. And individuals shaking their fist against God will stand against him and God will mete out his wrath upon them. What's not often talked about, though, is that the 
tribulation period is an unparalleled time of evangelism and faith. People will be coming to Christ by the droves. The, the, the penalty might be death or martyrdom. There won't be large organized churches anymore because Antichrist will be ruling and great destruction and desolation ever more increasing. You'll use the image of a w woman giving birth and the birth pangs at the first are lighter than the birth pangs at the end and yet they increase in their intensity and go on. Remember now our structure from Daniel chapter 9. There's a seven-year period for Israel, one week left. Antichrist will make this firm covenant with Israel. Antichrist will break the covenant with Israel. He will then bring abominations on Israel. Israel will be the focal point of his efforts. Jesus speaks wonderfully, a beautiful chapter, not only Luke 17, but Matthew 24, known as the Olivet Discourse. Spend some time noticing the parallels of Daniel, Revelation, as well as what you'll see in the Olivet Discourse. Jesus speaking predicts that there will be deceptions and wars and famines and earthquakes. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. I take that to be the first half of the tribulation period. And then he says, Jesus says, when you see that which Daniel the prophet prophesied, the abomination of desolation, which I take to be the Antichrist, standing up in the Jewish temple, rebuilt at that time, declaring himself to be God. The Jews know that now they've been faked out by this guy. And Jesus tells them, run for the hills, for then there will be great tribulation, what we know as the last half of the tribulation period. The events of the tribulation period, however, are best detailed in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. Revelation has 22 chapters. The bulk of the book of Revelation focuses on the subject of the tribulation period, these two, three and a half year periods. And you can easily and quickly remember the key components, if you will, of the tribulation period by the three things sort of in yellow. There's a series of seven, what's called seal judgments. It's not an animal, a seal. It's like a stamp on a letter. And they are sealed and then given out and opened up one after each other. I think that's the very first part of the tribulation period, Revelation 6 through 8, 5. Then the trumpet judgments come after that, and they comprise chapter 8 through chapter 11. And right after that, the main character, the beast, known as the Antichrist, the false prophet, sort of his communication expert. Individuals are required to take the mark of the beast as an act of worship to do politics, to do economics, to do any kind of social encounter. It is a religious moment in which those are now swearing their allegiance to, act, uh, to Antichrist. And then the last half of the tribulation period, as the birth pangs intensify, the bowl judgments. Probably the most famous of the bowl judgments is what we would know as Armageddon. It's really a series of battles, I take it. But in particular, this concept has caught our fancy to talk about Armageddon. Let's see what the Bible says about it. It's actually a Hebrew word, Armageddon. It comes directly from the Hebrew word for hill, which is Har, and it talks about a city in which there's a fortress called Megiddo. So it's the hill at Megiddo that has this perch over this vast valley, the valley of Jezreel, this hilltop fortress just a little southwest of Nazareth in northern Israel. Napoleon called it the perfect battlefield. I've seen it. It's agrarian today. It's flat in the valley, and these kind of buttes, like in southern, southern New Mexico, kind of rise up, and the generals can easily stand there and direct the war. The valley extends all the way from the, the Mediterranean Sea on the west all the way to the Jordan River in the central part of Israel. A huge area could hold millions of of warriors. I take it that's what's going to be happening not only in chapter 16, but as the armies gather there, the fall of Babylon will occur, this great uh, sort of economic, political, religious event that has occurred. There's a religious branch described in chapter 17. There's a commercial aspect of Babylon. Many will hold that Babylon is just sort of a system that's not really referring to the place called Babylon in modern-day Iraq. I actually disagree with that. If you take a look at all the names of the cities 
and the countries and the places in the book of Revelation, you'll see that the normal correct interpretation, at least in my understanding, would be to take it as real, as normal. So I hold to a literal revived empire of Babylon centered in Iraq, whose religious, political, and economic influence will impact the whole world. Remember, the tribulation period is not marked by a powerful church. There are individuals who come to Christ, often under great duress, but they're not organized like they are now. I think we restrain this kind of evil. We'll be running for the hills, the believers that have come to Christ during that time. I think the church will be raptured. Those Jewish evangelists will go around evangelizing people. Will come, they'll come to Christ, but under great duress. And this kind of activity could occur. It seems to be from my perspective of what the scripture might be saying. The great return of the Lord is captured with this beautiful image of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the church raptured in heaven. Our, we are his bride. We're now married to him. He returns and ends the tribulation period with the great glorious return of Christ. Perhaps my favorite verse in the book of Revelation. The image is overwhelming to me. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. It is just to judge. It is, notice, but his judgment is righteous. It is done correctly. And he wars against those that are against him. Notice, he renders judgment. He ends the tribulation. Armies are actually fighting each other and then turn to fight against God. The beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are seized. They're thrown into the lake of fire. And the tribulation period ends with the return of the Lord Jesus. God on earth about to set up a rule, a rule that we know as the millennial kingdom. Now, a lot of folks will say that's just another term for heaven. I think the idea of the millennial kingdom, though, is really a fulfillment of a great many Old Testament prophecies that refer to a literal throne on earth in and around Jerusalem for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me make my case for that. Revelation chapter 20 is where most folks go. We will as well, because Revelation 20 lets us know how long this period of time will be. Revelation chapter 20, notice the frequency with, in which God, or with John writes. He says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key to the abyss and the great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon. Who's the dragon? He's the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he binds him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and he shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image during the tribulation period and had not received the mark on their forehead and the mark on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, I take it to be unbelievers, did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power and they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. John tried to accomplish lots of things. One of them was to let us know how long he thinks that period of time is going to be. Six times in seven verses, he used the phrase thousand years. Now, some will hold it that maybe that's just a, a term, a symbol. Uh, it is obviously, we, we get the word millennium from the, the Latin word mele for thousand. But the, but the idea that maybe it's just a concept of a symbol, I think can actually be refuted quite easily uh, in the book of Revelation as we take a look at some other numbers that I think will take us just a moment but might help us see that John might, in fact, although it's a vision, I'll grant you, might be telling us the length of the, tri of the millennial kingdom period of time. Elsewhere, we see numbers sort of working out. There are 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are sealed, protected, and they go around evangelizing the world. 
The math works. There's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. That checks out to 144,000. The, the effect of stings of certain uh, scorpions and stuff lasts five months. That, that seems normal to interpret it as literal five 30-day periods. 42 months in a, chapter 11 of the book of Revelation, uh, the Gentiles trod the city. Antichrist sort of sets up his rule in Jerusalem. 42 months is three and a half years. That fits Daniel's prophecy of half of seven. 1,260 days is stated in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. That works out to be three and a half years also. 7,000 are killed by an earthquake. The overwhelming, I think, takeaway from an understanding of numbers in the book of Revelation that although it's prophetic literature, although it's a vision, you can also communicate actual truth. I think he's telling us that this kingdom on earth most prophesied in the Old Testament, by the way, all John lets us know really is how long it is, is actually a time in which the serpent will be imprisoned for a thousand years. The tribulation period, or the tribulation believers will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Old Testament saints will participate in the millennial kingdom. The rapture church had returned with Christ in Revelation 19 and now reigns with him for a thousand years. When Christ returns to earth, y'all, he's going to set up a kingdom. It's going to be literal, it's going to be real, and it's going to be focused in Jerusalem. And it will rule the world through that. Jesus himself says it in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, with him then he will sit on his glorious throne. When he returns to earth, he will sit on his throne. And the beauty of the millennial kingdom helps us see the power of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now, we're kind of New Testament-y. We tend to think that I'm going to check out what Paul says, and I'm going to see what maybe Mark says over here or Peter. And you're not going to be able to see the millennial kingdom as clearly biblically if the lens of your gaze is only in the New Testament. If you step back and see the whole Word of God, and let us become men and women of the whole word of God, you'll see that the, really the Old Testament is the place that in which we, it literally demands a literal and physical return of Christ to establish his kingdom. The Abrahamic covenant, sort of the seedbed of all covenants in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, calls for a land, a posterity, a ruler, a spiritual blessing. How does that unfold? It unfolds through a series of other covenants found in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 30, the land covenant promises Israel occupation of the land. In, the, in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant says that that ruler must come through the lineage of David. That's why Matthew presents Jesus in his genealogy, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. You have to be related to David to be king of Israel. And Jesus will fulfill that for he is related to David. The new covenant initially in Jeremiah 31, prophesied and promised to Israel. We participate in it, in the forgiveness of sin, but its ultimate ramification, its ultimate effect will be in and through Israel. The millennial kingdom then is the enactment and enjoyment of the fulfillment of the covenants as Israel is regathered from the nations, converted to Messiah in a beautiful section of scripture in Zechariah chapter 12. He says, and they will mourn for him whom they, whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him whom they pierced, whom they crucified, who's pierced him in the side on the cross. And when Israel gets it and brings sort of a, a, a re-understanding of all their knowledge throughout the Old Testament, now an understanding of Messiah really is, it will be an unparalleled time of spiritual blessing and enjoyment as they are converted to Christ and restored to their land under Messiah's rule. And as Gentiles, participation awaits as well. Unparalleled times physically, spiritually, let me just throw a few at you here. Notice where all these, almost all of them come from. It's going to be Isaiah. It's going to be Amos. It's going to be Zechariah. It's going to be Jeremiah. Old Testament books that are the primary place in which the kingdom is prophesied. Peace, joy, comfort, no poverty, sickness is gone, righteousness is gone, obedience, holiness, truth reigns. Christ will rule as king, David as his regent. 
it is populated by human beings who live through the tribulation period. And they will have children just like we have children. And some will sin and some will come to Christ. There will be a time of upheaval even. Nobles and governors will also rule, we see during this time, as government will be fair and just and a minister for righteousness. Jerusalem will be the center of the world. It will be called the city of truth. It will literally topographically rise above the plains around it and be seen as the place uh, uh, to which you ascend up to. Other topographical changes are prophesied by, by uh, Zechariah. Perhaps any college campus you go to has this engraved on some building. It comes from Micah, talking about the millennial kingdom. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any time. The beauty of the millennial kingdom, God on earth, a benevolent dictator telling us what to do. At the end of the, king, of the millennial kingdom, amazing things happen. Satan is released as promised from his prison. He goes about and deceives the nations. Again, we fall for his deceptions. And so you see that the millennial kingdom, opportunity to sin is certainly there. And Satan is then banished forever uh, to the lake of fire. The unsaved dead of all ages are then resurrected and placed before the great white throne judgment at the end of Revelation chapter 20 and assign their place in the lake of fire according to their deeds, it says. So you see how the restoration is ongoing? From the, from the church being removed and, and, and blessed in heaven while God's judgment comes on earth, but while that judgment is occurring, there's a cleansing and a blessing that happens to those that come to Christ. The millennial kingdom gets us a little closer to what's it like to live under the rulership of God. What's the only thing left is the very removal of sin. Imagine life without the ability to sin. Imagine life with no effect of anything connected to the fall. Genesis 1 and 2, perfect two chapters. Only two that remain perfect are Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, which the scripture knows calls the new heaven and new earth. There's probably not a subject we've thought about more than this subject of heaven, and the Bible doesn't talk all that much about it. Love the image from Field of Dreams where Ray's dad asks, is this heaven? And of course the answer is no, it's, it's Iowa. And in the summer it's close, but it's not quite heavenly. But the idea of this afterlife with God, how can that be? And how do I participate in that? How can I be a part of that? The Bible doesn't say quite as much as we'd like to, but if it says anything, it's going to be in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 as we close here. The context, obviously, in general is both two chapters. But these four verses, along with Revelation 19, just knock me out. These verses unfold all the, the stench, if you will, of sin from Genesis 3 up into this time, notice, John says, I saw a new heaven and new earth, and for the first had passed away. No longer any sea, and he sees a holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. The scripture goes on to say, and he, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God, the house of God, this holy city, is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them and will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have fallen away. The wonder of this heaven and earth being joined, it's distinct, I take it, from the millennial kingdom, but notice how the restorative aspects continue. The millennial kingdom taught us how to live under the rulership of God, even in the presence of sin. And now we have the opportunity to live under the rulership of God without even the opportunity, the ability to sin in the last two chapters found in the Word of God. Notice in the new heaven and new earth, there's no sea, no death. 
all new, no temple, no sun, nor moon, no night, no un anything unclean, the curse is lifted. Thus, those things still existed in the millennial kingdom, but now the full culmination of restoration occurs in Revelation 21 and 22. And I encourage you to spend times in those books. I don't know, you know, remember the book of Revelation is a vision. After which I'm certain John took a nap because there's a whole lot of stuff that he saw. And this is the last thing he sees is this huge cube coming down out of heaven and either suspending over the earth or resting upon it. He gives us the dimensions, more numbers. He says it's 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way, and 1,500 miles in the air. So it's either a cube or a pyramid. Let's say it's a cube. It would cover two-thirds of the United States. From Florida to Maine, north and south, south to north, and then from Florida over to Arizona, imagine something that size coming down out of heaven. Plenty of room for people to hang out in. On the earth, there's no longer any sea, remember. So there's lots of rooms mathematically for people to live if he's describing what heaven is really like. And I think he is this amazing union of heaven and earth. I don't know if it's in the air. I don't know if it cut, touches the ground. I think there's access to both. Notice it's made ready. This city is made ready as a bride. Same Greek word he used, by the way, in John 14, where I go and prepare a place for you. I think what he's saying is that which I've gone and been preparing for you is now made ready and comes to be the dwelling place of God and us with God. Perhaps the holy city then is what Jesus is now preparing and will be the eternal home of the redeemed after the rapture, what we would call heaven. Let me end with this. This idea of a city, by the way, is not unique to Revelation chapter 22. What we see was Abraham was looking for a city whose architect and builder was God. Those that had died and scribed in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, they desire a better country, it says. And they, that, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. Elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, you have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul talks about the Jerusalem above. Jesus speaking in Revelation 3 says, the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. What we see is this wonderful idea. What heaven really is, is the final destiny and abode of all believers from all eras. It is the union of heaven and earth forever. Technically, it seems that we don't go to heaven. Heaven comes to us. I take it that we are of the ground. We are Adama. We are Adam. I think our eternal existence will always have an earthly component. God's component is that of heaven, and heaven and earth merge together, if you will, and there's access to both. It is God dwelling with redeemed humanity on earth. It is the ultimate God with us, Emmanuel, fully and finally. And John ends his document with very simple application. It's one of the few times the Bible just tells us what to do. Even so, Lord, come. Come, Lord Jesus, as we've seen it from the rapture to the tribulation to what awaits in the millennial kingdom and the certain return of God in the form of the new heaven and new earth, our response is to redirect our attention back to God, to see the beautiful accuracy of the scripture, to never allow his power and his wisdom to be marginalized. See God as one who has the whole world at his hand and the future and our destiny is certain and sure with him. He protects us from the counterfeit. He draws us to comfort he draws us to holiness. He reveals finally and fully the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this small bit of time just to spend with you thinking about these things. I pray for each one here that you might give us opportunity outside this place to think upon these things. Draw us close to you. Provide comfort for those that need it. Allow us to be more like you as we see your sure and certain return. 
We pray this in the full and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.